At the dawn of the third millennium, agriculture must face two major challenges, meet ever-increasing food requirements and preserve natural resources. In developing countries in humid tropical zones, animal farming is growing at an unprecedented rate. It is in these zones that the pressure on the environment is increasing the most. Moreover, the evolution of systems of agricultural production towards very intensive specific forms of farming is contributing to transforming the farmer into a pollutant. It is therefore becoming more than necessary to adopt those integrated farming techniques that are least prejudicial to the environment. These techniques can be implemented in Asia and also in certain areas of Africa and Latin America they can meet the food needs of constantly increasing populations. It is possible to optimize the use of natural resources in humid tropical zones by integrating farming with other subsystems like aquaculture, rice growing, market gardening and fruit farming. The products of one system can partially serve as a resource for the others. This integration thus contributes to a significant increase in the overall productivity of the agricultural ecosystem and consequently in the farmer's incomes. Different populations have invented primitive systems of fish farming by simply improving the productivity of the aquatic environment. In Benin, the farmers have created a very simple way of intensifying production. This system, known as Acadia, is still practiced today in the shallow waters of the lagoon of Porto Novo. It consists of planting bamboo poles or other shrubs to form an enclosure. Within this enclosure, from 8 to 16 branches are planted or laid per square meter. These branches will attract and concentrate the fish, providing them with a refuge and abundant food in the form of algae, protozoa, insect larva and so on. Each year, from 1,000 to 20,000 kilos of fish are harvested per hectare. 
This is carried out by removing the branches and bringing together the fish by means of a surrounding net. The yield depends on the density of the brushwood. The main species caught are brackish water tilapias and catfish. The alo is a variant of the Acadia system and is adapted to the rivers of the plains. It consists of laying out branches over a width of several meters alongside the banks. On these branches, semi-aquatic surface plants grow and great numbers of fish take refuge there and feed. The fish are harvested in the dry season by encircling the system with a long net and then proceeding sector by sector to remove the vegetation and the brushwood. This technique gives a yield of between 1,000 and 2,000 kilos of fish per hectare. The fish caught are mainly tilapia and species with accessory air breathing, catfish, fish with large scales. In the Ueme floodplain in Benin, the farmers have dug long trenches one and a half meters deep and four meters wide. The trenches, known as Wedo, are of a technologically more advanced level. They are flooded during the rainy season, but trap the fish and retain their water when the waters recede and throughout the dry season. Section by section, these wedu are cleared of the thick semi-aquatic vegetation, which will be used as organic fertilizer on the dikes. The fish are then harvested one section at a time 
by means of mobile reed barriers. On the sides of these trenches, as soon as the waters recede, the raised dikes are planted with vegetables. The rest of the plain, which is covered with dead aquatic plants, is prepared for the planting of maize. These yields of vegetables, maize and fish represent the first level of sustained integration, allowing relatively high yields to be maintained through the recycling of organic matter produced naturally. These systems could be further improved by stocking the widow with artificially raised young fish of identical age, such as clarias. Furthermore, regularly feeding the fish with local plants, such as the aquatic fern Azola, which grows naturally in ponds, could easily increase yields. This strategy for intensifying production has been developed for centuries in Asia and constitutes the semi-intensive systems of integrated fish farming. Fish farming, which first appeared in China more than 3,000 years ago, developed there by being integrated with farming and breeding activities, beginning with such simple combinations as rice and fish. Thus, rainwater rice growing, highly developed in Asia for many centuries, allows fish in the wild to be trapped. Irrigated rice growing, a more developed form, involves trapping such fish within the rice growing area. When the rice is harvested, this technique leads to catches of between 20 and 60 kilos of fish per hectare. One simple way of increasing this production consists in digging alongside the rice field sections trenches one meter deep, which serve as refuges for the fish. Simply by doing this, without any additional feeding, the yield of fish can be increased by as much as 200 kilos per hectare. By making this simple link between fish and rice, Asian farmers have multiplied and complexified possible forms of integration, while constantly recycling the organic matter produced by the agro-fishing ecosystem, thus inventing true sustainable development long before the Rio conference of 1992. <laughs> The agro-fishing integration worked out by the farmers of the Mekong Delta shows in this drawing a rice field surrounded by trenches one meter deep. Fish and shrimps reproduce and grow there. Ducks swim on the surface. The dikes are planted with vegetables, cabbages, beans, soya, maize, etc. and fruit trees, pawpaws, bananas, mangoes, etc. or with bamboo. The arrows indicate the use of the resources. Fertile water penetrates the cultivated dikes. The silt is recovered and spread over the dikes. Animal manure serves to fertilize the water. The fish and shrimps moving around in the rice field eat up the weeds as well as the various insects harmful to rice growing. This link between rice and fish can easily be further intensified by directly feeding the fish with local byproducts such as rice bran, soya cake, etc. In this case, the yield of fish can easily attain 2,000 kilos per hectare. As for the rice harvest, this is increased by around 10% thanks to the fish droppings. When one knows that the area of land devoted to irrigated rice growing covers more than 1 million hectares, one can imagine the quantities of fish that can be harvested. The dike pond system favors the interaction between land and water, a source of exchange of energy and matter. 
the land recovered from the marshy regions forms dikes situated at 50 centimetres above the water. These dikes are regularly fertilised with organic silt in the course of the regular maintenance of the ponds. Given the contact of the roots with the fertile water of the ponds, those plants with short cycles, such as cabbages, beans, soya, tomatoes, maize, can be harvested up to three times a year. Fruit trees, such as banana and pawpaw, because of the water penetration, can go on producing fruit even in the dry season. ponds for fattening the fish, different species are mixed that have a complementary food diet, as in Asia, or else one species alone is used, the African tilapia, which thanks to its omnivorous capacities, plays almost the same role as the different Asiatic species combined. In certain cases, a few fish of high commercial value and rapid growth rate, such as catfish, may be added. The fish are harvested annually as a rule, and the yields are in the order of two to 8,000 kilos per hectare, depending on the intensity of the fertilization of the ponds and the complementary feeding of the fish. Other Asiatic farmers who specialize in the breeding of ducks make use of their droppings for fish farming. The duck house is usually built on the dike beside the pond where the ducks are fed. The ducks can thus move about freely on the pond, providing all the fertilizer needed and food for the fish. Depending on market demands, the farmers raise ducks for egg production or for consumption. In the latter case, some farmers concentrate on raising ducklings whose fattening is subsequently undertaken by other farmers for family needs or commercial purposes. Feeding the ducks for the family can be achieved by growing a series of aquatic and semi-aquatic plants on the spot, such as lemna and azola, that can be mixed with rice bran and maize flour. For commercial purposes, a balanced food mixture can be used. In some cases, the organic silt of the pond is used to grow ornamental plants in pots. For duck breeders, fish farming accounts for 10 to 20 percent of the integrated farm income. Chicken farmers also make use of the bird's droppings in a similar way. However, in this case, the egg-laying chickens and those raised for consumption are kept in hen houses. The hen houses can be built on the dike of the pond. Or better still, on piles, which means that all droppings go directly into the pond without any loss of nitrogen and cuts down all additional work. The feeding of the chickens for family needs can be achieved by growing a series of aquatic and semi-aquatic plants mixed with rice bran and various forms of flour. For commercial purposes, a balanced mixture is obtained. Fish production can represent a substantial part of the farmer's income, from between 20 and 40 percent. This type of farming in any case gives a better return than simply growing rice as is demonstrated by the conversion of vast stretches of rice fields in the south of Thailand into ponds for fish farming with large hen houses on piles.
Pig farmers, who raise pigs for fattening or sows for reproduction, normally build their pigsties on the dikes of the ponds. Daily cleaning means that all excrement and waste go into the water of the pond. For family needs, the pigs are fed on chopped land vegetation or aquatic plants that are mixed with rice bran and different forms of flour. Fish production here accounts for between 20 and 30 percent of the integrated farm's income. In Vietnam and Rwanda, attempts to integrate the raising of rabbits with fish farming are currently being made to meet family needs. The rabbits are always kept in hutches, which may be built on piles on the edge of the dike, in order to allow all waste to drop into the water. However, these hard droppings are relatively poor in nutrients, for they are the result of twofold digestion. The rabbits can be fed on a series of land plants that occur naturally and possibly mixed with a food mix for rabbits. In the ponds, these attempts are being made either by raising tilapias or clarias or by mixing the two species. Through simple ways of linking land and water farming, the ecological farmers of the third world, who are obliged to produce food at a price commensurate with the low income of the consumers, have intensified and diversified their systems of farming. They have therefore devised a variety of complex links with a view to optimizing the flow of matter and energy on their farms. We can see from these various concrete instances the example of a line of recycled agro-fish productions aimed at sustainable development. The waste resulting from the raising of chickens, pigs and cattle can have a dual destination. Solid waste is recovered for making compost containing maggots and earthworms. These are collected daily and fed to the fish. As for liquid waste, mixed with solid waste, this is directed towards a biodigester for the production of biogas. These units of biogas have the advantage of eliminating most of the animal and human health problems linked to the contamination of waste by microorganisms. In addition, this is a source of domestic energy. The effluence from the biodigester flows into the pond making the water rich in nutrients, thus producing vegetable and animal plankton for consumption by the fish. The ponds can also serve to produce aquatic plants with high protein content, such as lemna and azola. These plants are harvested regularly and can be used when fresh or dried, as the case may be. Mixed with other byproducts, rice bran, oil cake, various forms of flour, they can serve to feed the poultry, the pigs, and even the fish, thus reducing the cost of feeding the animals. At the bottom of the pond, a substantial quantity of organic silt accumulates, rich in fertilizer, fish manure. This silt must be removed regularly in order to avoid the water silting up and becoming poisoned. It serves to enrich the soil of the rice fields or the dikes which are used for market gardening or fruit farming. The waste from the compost is also used for this purpose. Weeds, the waste from vegetables and fruit, are used to fertilize the water by adding compost to the pond. Rice bran, oil cake and so on are used to feed the animals being raised and the fish. The structure of the system can be schematized at four levels. The first level concerns the farming, the second the digestion of the organic matter by forming compost or via the biogas digester, the third the pond, and the fourth the dike. The functional relations optimizing the flow of matter of the ecosystem are symbolized by the arrows, 
which indicate that the waste organic matter is going to be digested either in the compost by maggots or earthworms or in a digester for producing biogas for domestic needs. The pond is going to receive the fertile water from the digester, which will ensure the growth of floating aquatic plants, lemna, azola, etc., phyto and zooplankton sources of food for the fish, as well as maggots transferred daily from the compost. Then the fertile waters of the ponds, along with the organic silt, are going to ensure the growth of the crops on the dikes. Finally, the functional cycle between these different levels is ensured in a sustainable way, since the waste from farming is used to provide some of the food for the animals being raised and for the fish. The mud from the digester and the compost that has been broken down by the maggots or worms is transferred to the soil on the dikes. We have thus gone full circle, which means that the farm functions as a closed circuit, but in any case nothing is lost and everything is recycled, which is the basic principle of sustainable development. The farmers obviously adapt their farming to local market requirements. The types of vegetables, fruit, ornamental plants, the kinds of poultry and the species of fish produced will vary over time in function of the sale price and consequently the expected financial benefits. The population explosion brings with it the need to produce more food on areas of land that are constantly being reduced. This intensification process has, in the developed countries, led to the setting up of more efficient agricultural units. This increase in productivity depends on farm mechanization, the use of herbicides, pesticides and chemical fertilizers. Taken as a whole, these means are costly with negative effects on the environment, the well-being of the farmers and the consumers. In Asia, another form of intensive farming has prospered for thousands of years on small farms. The farmers there have amply demonstrated the efficacy, the profitability and the sustainability of integrated farming in humid tropical zones. They are continuing to improve their yields without any harm to the environment. One can hope that this practical integration of sustainable activities will serve as an inspiration to farmers in numerous humid zones in Africa and Latin America, and that in future they will receive more support from development decision makers and financial sponsors. A better management of the world's natural resources is essential if we are to attain the twofold objective of sustainable agricultural production, feed the world's growing population and preserve our natural resources. We therefore need to exercise control over farming expansion and better integrate it into global systems of agro-fish production.